right, good afternoon. Uh, let's get started. Today's topic is uh, deep learning. I've um, mentioned the name a little bit already, but now we're finally going to find out what it's really all about. Uh, and we left off on Thursday, for those of you who were there, we left off here. This is what we discussed uh, in the first half on Thursday. We discussed neural networks. And neural networks are this um, graphical model, basically, representing graphically a computation. So we have some nodes, and on every node is a value. And every node has some incoming connections to other nodes. And to compute the value of a node, we multiply the value on the incoming nodes by the number that is on the edge. And then we sum over all these multiplied values for all the incoming nodes. And usually, we also apply what's called an activation function. And that's the basic principle of a neural network. And then we organize it like this in layers. So if, uh, there are la no, no connections within a layer, and every layer is fully connected to every node in the layer below it. That's called a feedforward network, which is basically just the simplest way of, of building a neural network. Uh, and then we looked at things, uh, reason, uh, sorry, then we looked at the ways we can train this using backpropagation um, to compute the gradient. Stuff like that. And today we're going to pick up from there because as we saw, neural networks for a long time, uh, interest in neural networks died out. Uh, because they were basically a little bit too difficult to train. It's very difficult to um, get a hang, uh, sort of get hold of, of, of what a neural network could do. And for a long time, support vector machines took over because they were easier to train and more easy to understand. Uh, so now we'll look at how we finally managed to get sort of proper control and proper training of these uh, these neural networks. Um. Get rid of this echo. Um. Yeah. So neural networks. Let's start here. And basically, I drew this uh, like like a. Um, I drew this like a. a a graphical model, like this uh, little graph, computation graph, um, which makes it look very fancy and which sort of highlights this original inspiration from the 60s that maybe this is a little bit like the brain or this is how our brains work. But actually, in a way, all we're doing here is, or the interesting things that are happening here are basically just linear algebra steps. So if we look at the first layer here, where we say we have one weight for every possible connection between one input node and one output node, that's basically a mat matrix multiplication. So if we take the input here, we ignore the bias for now. So we just look at the input. And uh, we create a layer, a, a layer of three hidden nodes. So then for every hidden node, there is a connection to every input node. So these two connections are there. And all, we do, all we're doing is multiplying by these weights and summing up the results for a given hidden node. So that's basically describing a matrix multiplication in graphical form. So that's the first step. Then the bias is basically adding a vector like this, uh, which gives us the uh, hidden nodes before the activation function, to which we apply the activation function, which is basically uh, uh, element-wise we apply the sigmoid function. So to every element of this vector, of this green vector, we apply the um, sigmoid function. And then we do the same for the second layer. So all we're doing is just a sequence of very basic linear algebra steps uh, with the occasional element-wise nonlinear function in here, like the sigmoid function. So we can also write the operation of our neural network like this which is a lot simpler. Um, does that help things? Yeah, I think that, oh no, that doesn't. Uh, so which is a lot simpler. And a lot, it, it looks a lot nicer, so this really simplifies things for us, which is nice. But it's also the key to efficiently implementing a neural network. Because what we did before, looking at it like, uh, like all these separate connections and these separate numbers that sort of implied uh, looping over all these nodes and multiplying all these things separately, which takes very long time. 
but actually matrix multiplication we can implement very efficiently. And we don't have to implement it very efficiently because other people have implemented it very efficiently. So we can call those functions. And basically, if we just write this down in some programming form, we get a very efficient uh, execution of our neural network. And that is compounded by a lot when we have access to a graphical processing unit, to a video card. Because video cards are very, very good at matrix multiplication. So this whole thing becomes about 20 times as fast if we can run these matrix multiplications on the GPU, which we can and do a lot. Um, so basically, this is sort of the first step of working out a general language, a general framework of talking about neural networks and showing that they're not really that neural and not really that networky, because basically it's a sequence of linear algebra operations. So all this neural network background, this neural uh, baggage is a little bit overblown. It's not that special, it's just matrices. Um, and this is sort of the first step in starting to think about a, a, a general framework, a general language in which, you, which to describe these things efficiently and uh, uh, simply, so that it becomes easy to define big and complicated neural networks, and it becomes easy to train them effectively. And that's basically what deep learning, uh, what has become deep learning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the plan will start by describing the basics of a deep learning system. Or framework, if you like. For which we will... Um, need to talk about tensors, matrix calculus, and we will need to revisit this backpropagation algorithm from last time, because we need to extend it to make it sort of powerful enough to deal with this kind of matrix stuff. And then a sort of grab back section, which I've called making it work, uh, in which I'll try to go through all of the steps, all of the tricks you need to um, get past this sort of neural network winter that we talked about, this period where we didn't know how to make neural networks bigger or deeper or perform better. And it takes a couple of tricks and a couple of insights to get past that point. So I'll talk about those in making it work. Uh, officially, I've put the break here. Today, I'm almost certain that I'm not going to finish this before the break, but let's pretend otherwise. So we'll see how far I get. Uh, anyway, once I've finished this making it work stuff, we can talk about some of the more interesting neural network layers. Well, what our first interesting neural network layer, so some, uh, a layer that does something a little bit more than this, just this fully connected layer. And that which is called the convolution layer. Which we can build into a convolutional network, a network for analyzing images. And we will discuss uh, an interesting neural network architecture called an autoencoder. Which is basically showing us that we can, uh, well, it's, it's, it's an, interesting neural, uh, an interesting architecture used for dimensionality reduction. And it's sort of showing, starting to show hopefully the flexibility of these um, deep learning approaches. And then finally, a category that you might expect at the end. But uh, uh, that you must, sorry, a category that you might expect at the beginning. But I put it at the end because there's something sort of on a slightly higher, more philosophical level to say about what we actually mean when we talk about deep learning and why we consider it so different from all the other forms of machine learning. Um, but I can really only explain that after I've discussed the technical details of uh, what deep learning is. So let's start there. Uh, and the first ingredient we need to build a deep learning system, or at least the way it's normally done, is a tensor, which is just a data structure. And it's just a generalization of a scalar matrix, a scalar vector matrix, and so on and so on. So we have a scalar, which is a number, basically a zero dimensional matrix. And then, oh, the animations are out of order, so I'll skip the animations. And then a vector is basically a one-dimensional matrix, 
Uh, so there's one index which changes direction in one, uh, which changes in one direction. Matrix is a two-dimensional matrix. Uh, so we can extend that to three dimensions by just adding an, uh, adding an index. So every element in this three tensor is indexed by three numbers. And you can make a four tensor or five tensor or six tensor. It's not really easy to visualize. So I usually, if I have to draw it for myself, I draw it like this with little dots. So we get a three tensor, we get a um, series of three tensors, as it were. And this fourth index here indexes these uh, separate three tensors. Uh, so there's really nothing special about this. It's just a data structure that allows you to store a bunch of numbers. Uh, so let's look at what a what sort of things we can store in tensors. Firstly, we've already seen uh, data sets that we've used. Um, for instance, this is from the first lecture. And this is usually stored as a matrix and a vector. So we store the feature data set, the features, uh, features by the instances as a matrix of numbers. And then we take the labels and we store that as a separate vector, y. Also put it together, it doesn't really matter. The only thing we need to, uh, need to be concerned with at this point is that um, we tend to uh, use only numeric features in deep learning. So tensors only contain, tensors have to have the same data type for all elements. So tensors usually contain floating point numbers. Uh, so if we have any categorical data, any categorical features in our data, or if we have a categorical target, like the classification task, we have to somehow transform it into uh, numeric features, either by one-hot coding, usually when it's a data feature, or by uh, integer coding, as we do with the classes. So that's pretty straightforward. As you would imagine, this is how you store a data set. Um, but you can, you can also store other forms of raw data. So let's say your input data are images. Uh, you can basically store one image in a three tensor. Uh, as you probably know, a color image works by storing every um, color value. So the color value of one single pixel is stored in three channels. Usually, if uh, it's an RGB image, it's three channels that indicate how red the pixel is, how green the pixel is, and how blue the pixel is. So just three numbers for every pixel. Which means that your color image is this kind of stack of three grayscale images one for each color channel, and if you combine those in the right way, you get a color picture. So this stack gives you a three tensor of the width and the height of the image and the color channels. That's three dimensions to describe an image. And then if you have a data set of images, so if you have multiple images, you can store that as a four tensor. So just add another index that iterates over the, that indexes the images in your data set. You can actually try this in Keras. If you import Keras datasets, you can load the CIFAR 10 dataset, uh, which is just a data set of a lot of very small images. And if you ask for the shape of that data set after it's been downloaded and loaded into memory, it will tell you it has four dimensions. Uh, 32 by 32 are the, is the resolution of the images. They're, like I said, they're very small images, very small square images. Uh, they're color images, so you have three color channels, and there are 50,000 of them. So that's your data dimension. So our data set in this case, because it's images, is a four tensor. And that's our basic, our basic ingredient, our basic data f item that we're going to manipulate. In the sort of basic view of a deep learning system, everything is a tensor. And now we're going to manipulate these tensors with functions. So a function is just uh, also called an operation in some frameworks, is just more or less the same as you expect a function to be in programming language. So it takes some inputs, and it does some computation, and then it gives you some outputs. Uh, so multiple inputs, multiple outputs. However, all the inputs and all the outputs are tensors. So in this function, x and y are both tensors. Could be matrices, could be vectors, could be three tensors, five tensors, whatever. And the same for the outputs. And the second difference with a normal function is that we don't just implement the forward computation, but we also implement a what is usually called a backward computation, which is basically working out the local gradient. 
which we already saw in the backpropagation algorithm. We, the principle of the backpropagation algorithm was that you define your computation, your, your neural network model, as a composition of modules or functions. I called them modules in the last lecture. Now I'm calling them functions. Uh, so you define it as a composition of functions. And then the gradient over the whole thing becomes the product of all the local gradients of every function. And this backward basically computes for you your local gradient, your local derivative. More about that later. But once we've done this and once we've defined lots of functions in this way, we can chain together these functions to build a computation graph from data to our label. Uh, in fact, from data to our loss term. So to our label, and then on the label we compute the loss. And then, because we have this computation graph, we can implement backpropagation to take this loss and backpropagate the loss throughout uh, the whole computation graph and setting the grade, computing the gradient at every node for every function by calling all these backward functions. And then once we have the gradient for this whole complicated computation graph, we can do a step of gradient descent. We can update the parameters. Um, so this requires you to somehow, using programming languages, define what the computation graph is. And there's two ways of doing that, lazy and eager. Uh, we'll start with lazy execution, which is basically using some programming statements. You define what your graph is. You compile it, or your framework compiles it. And then you tell it what data to feed through the graph and to uh, what loss uh, to feed backward, as it were. Uh, so the main thing here is you define it once, you compile it, and then it's static. And then you start your training phase on that graph. So once you start training, your graph is fixed, um, which is sort of a straightforward way of doing it. But it's not really ideal because if something goes wrong, if you have a complicated computation graph and something goes wrong halfway because you mixed up one of these tensor dimensions, for instance, um, you can't get back to where you made the mistake because you made the mistake while you were defining the computation graph, then it was compiled, and then we started using it and then something went wrong. So when, sh when you get your error, you look at your output of your program, you get your error, you're not actually, you can't actually see which line of your program contained the mistake. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so a computation graph is just what we do when we chain together. I'll, we'll show some examples later. But if you have this function, uh, yep, like this, you have one of these functions. Uh, let's say it's plus. So it takes its two inputs, and it provides an output by adding their two functions. Then you can define. You can say, well, I want one of these modules. And the input to this module is going to be the output of a multiplication function, which has two more uh, inputs. And you chain together all these functions to define, essentially, a program. That's basically what I mean by computation graph. And this neural network is. Uh, yeah, uh, the idea is that we're going to use these computation graphs to describe neural networks. Um, yeah, so lazy mode is uh, not ideal. It it's makes it easy to store models and it makes it easy to optimize models, but it makes it very difficult to debug and to do research. And you're fixed with this static model. You cannot change the model during training. You have to define your model and then train on it. So there's a better option. Uh, which is currently the default in a framework called PyTorch and will be the default when TensorFlow 2.0 comes out soon, which is called eager execution. And eager execution, you basically define your computation graph by performing the computations. So while your program is running, essentially what it's doing is it's remembering what you've done and remembering the computation graph. So once you've done your programming, and you've ended up with a loss function. That's one variable that contains the whole computation, the whole history of how you ended up with that value underwater. Uh, and because this is becoming, looks like it's becoming the default way of doing things, we'll look into this way of building a computation graph a little bit more 
uh, with a little bit more detail. Uh, yes, so the question is for very big programs, would this be very intensive? Yes, but um, that's true for the lazy mode as well. You basically, you have to store your whole neural network. And usually what you do is you take bits and pieces of it to the GPU and back again. So it's usually your limit is, well, your limit is somewhere in between your GPU memory and your CPU memory. But yeah, uh, either way, you have to store the whole thing in memory. So let's look at an example, very simple example of, uh, eager, of how uh, an eager mode system um, builds up a computation graph. So we're going to compute the function a plus b equals c. And we'll do it with scalars for now. So we make two variables, a and b. And a variable, I'm taking the um, terminology from PyTorch. I forget what it's called in TensorFlow, but all these frameworks call these things slightly differently. But we'll call it a variable for now. And a variable is a node in our computation graph, like this, which stores several things. It stores the data, so the actual value of the variable. And it stores, or it, make, it has a position, it has some room for the gradient, which we're going to compute later. So we don't know it yet, but we have a little uh, field for it ready. Um, and we make these just as, as objects in Python. So we just call variable one variable, uh, A is variable one, B is variable two, and that's, those are our variable objects. Then we compute, oh, I guess I changed this at the last minute. We're computing A times B. So we apply one of these functions to uh, A and B. And the way we apply it is just by computing it. So we just say, give me A times B. And because this uh, multiplication operator, the star operator in Python, you can overload it. You can add, uh, add your own meaning to it. Underwater, what happens is that the function multiplication is applied to these two variables. And it gives us back a new variable, which we call C. And that variable contains the result of our computation. So we've taken the data from A and we've taken the data from B and we've multiplied them to get some new data, which is the data of C. But it also contains a field for the gradient and references back to the objects that created it. So we also remember that C was created by applying the multiply operator to the objects A and B. Because that's how we're going to do this backpropagation later. And then uh, we somehow call, we somehow tell the framework that we want to do backpropagation. At some point we say, well, now our computation graph is finished. We've ended up with the scalar value. Now we're going to do backpropagation, so compute all the gradients. And then the framework will go back through the graph. It will work out the gradient for C, which is 1, because it's this gradient of C over C. Gradient of C over A is 2, value of B, and vice versa. So that's the basics of how this system works underwater. And if we implement a neural network in um, a framework like this, got some weird animations happening again, then it looks something like this. So we start with some, so we have this neural network here. In fact, we're computing the loss over the neural network, uh, which is basically we do by taking a, uh, creating a variable x, multiplying it by a variable w, we get some value in return, which I haven't given an explicit name. Then we apply the bias, we apply the sigmoid, and so on and so on, and then finally we compute the loss. And on this loss value, we can say backprop, do the back, start the backpropagation from this loss value, and then it goes all the way back through the graph, and it gives us the gradient specifically over the ones, over the, the nodes for which we, the variables for which we want the gradient, namely the parameters of the neural network. The colored boxes here, those are the ones we want the gradient over. And once we have that gradient, then it's very straightforward to perform one step of gradient descent because we just update this value by subtracting a little bit of the gradient. So that's the basic layout of your deep learning system. 
And in order to make this work, we need to uh, have uh, we need to revisit back propagation. We need to look at two things that I didn't tell you about earlier. First is what to do if you have multiple computation paths in your computation graph leading to the same value. Uh, that doesn't work. That uh, the um, chain rule that we've seen so far doesn't help you. You need a little bit of an extension of the chain rule. And the second step is that we need to do this with tensors. So we have all our intermediate values in this deep learning system are tensors instead of scalar values. And so far, we've only done backpropagation with scalars. So we need to figure out a way to do this backpropagation with tensors while keeping them tensors. Because we want to do this backpropagation, back we want to work out these derivatives in terms of matrix operations. Instead of unpacking this tensor into a huge number of scalars and looping over them, because that's slow, we want to work out backpropagation in such a way that it's all matrix operations. Let's look at this multivariate chain rule first. Uh, multivariate chain rule you need when you run into a diamond in your computation graph. So here we have a computation graph. W is somehow turned into A and computed into B, and those two become the input of C, which provides an output. And if we now want the derivative of C with respect to W, um, we have this diamond in our computation graph which means that W influences the value of C along two paths. And the regular chain rule doesn't tell us what to do here, so we need the multivariate chain rule, which luckily is very, very simple. And it basically says, take the derivative with respect to one of your inputs, so we're doing the, trying to apply the chain rule over these, uh, the inputs of C. Uh, we have two inputs, so we don't know what to do. And the multivariate chain rule just tells us take the input with respect to take the derivative with respect to your first input, you're, uh, treating the other one as a constant, and add it to the derivative with respect to the other input, treating the first as a constant. So basically, what we're saying the value of c uh, is determined by this val by this input and by this input. Both of them have a gradient, and they're sort of both pulling the value of c in different directions. So if we want to know the total influence of B on this, uh, on this C, we just sum these two directions in which C is pulled. So that's the multivariate chain rule, which is very useful. We're going to look back, uh, refer to that a couple of times. Um, but practically, this means if you have a computation graph, you can now work out what all the local derivatives are using this multivariate chain rule. So then we come to matrix calculus. So I uh, had uh, uh, some slides like this in the last lecture, but uh, with scalars. So now we have them with uh, matrices. So if we break up our neural network into modules, into subcomputer or functions, let's call them functions. Um, these are basically the functions. So the loss over the output of the neural network. Then the output is just a linear function of the hidden layer times V plus C. The hidden layer is the result of the sigmoid over K. And then k is just a linear function over w and b. So those are our modules. And what we would like to do is just use these modules to derive, to apply the gradient, um, sorry, to apply the chain rule and get these local gradients, one local gradient for every module, like this. That's what we would like to do. So the question is, can we? Is there some, is there some way of thinking about uh, linear algebra that allows us to take the derivative with respect to a vector, to take the derivative uh, of a vector with respect to a matrix. Can we do that? And if so, what does it mean? So far, we've only taken derivatives of one scalar with respect to another scalar. So I'll start with a simple example. So let's say we have a function that outputs a scalar whose input is a vector. And we'll make the function as simple as possible. So we'll just look at the dot product here. So a is the dot product. So uh, the function f is the dot product of a and b. What would it mean to um, take the derivative of that function with respect to the input a? And the trick with all of these things, if you're confused or if you don't know what 
how to do this is to first look at one element of the thing you are taking the derivative over. So this we're taking the derivative with respect to a vector. Let's just look at one element of that vector, because then it's a derivative of a scalar over a scalar, and then we know how to do it. So just write out the whole function, see what it looks like, and then we can have a think about what that means for this expression here. So let's do that with the um, element three of vector A. So we're just looking, ta just taking the derivative of this dot product with respect to element three of the vector. Well, we can write out the dot product, which is this sum, just multiply all the uh, respective elements of A and B together and sum them. And we see that A3 only occurs in one of these terms, so we can ignore the other terms. And taking the derivative, we get B3. So that means that if we take the derivative with respect to AI, we end up with BI. In other words, the derivative with respect to the whole vector is just a vector of numbers, which is just the gradient. So actually, this one we had seen before. But that's the basic principle. So the um, derivative of one tensor with respect to the other tensor gives you every single possible scalar derivative. It gives you every the derivative of every element of the output over every element of the input, which in this case is a vector. One more example. Let's say we have a vector over a matrix. So we have a function of a vector uh, that outputs a vector. Uh, so it's actually actually vector over vector. Uh, anyway, let's do vector over vector then. Um, so a function of a vector that outputs a vector. And to keep things simple, it's just a matrix multiplication. So just Fa equals B times A. And we want to know what is the derivative of this vector, the output vector, over the input vector. And again, to simplify things for ourselves, we'll just look at a scalar derivative. So we'll just take one element of the output and one element of the input, see what that looks like, and then see if that gives us some inspiration about how to rewrite uh, or how to interpret this uh, value here. So we'll take the second element of the output and the third element of the input over the third element of the input. So this, remember, this is just a vector. So we're just taking the second element of whatever vector pops out of this matrix multiplication. Uh, I've had to invent a little bit of notation here. So this B2 dot is my notation for the second row of vector B. Uh, sorry, second row of matrix B. So if this is matrix B, we're looking at the second row of matrix B because multiplying uh, matrix B times A is just taking the dot product of every row of B with A. So in this case, since we're only interested in the second element, we are taking the dot product of the second row of B and A. That gives us the second element of the result of this multiplication. And then again, we can write out the dot product as a sum. And as we can see again, only one term of that sum is actually relevant, so all the other ones disappear. And the derivative works out as B, uh, as the cell 2, 3, so 2, 3 of matrix B. Which means that if we take the derivative of the second element of the output with the third element of the input, of this matrix multiplication, we're actually asking for uh, cell two by three, uh, cell two three of matrix B. So we can interpret this thing. If we take all of those, all the possible values that we can get, all the possible ways we can do this, and arrange them into a matrix, we get the matrix B. So actually, the derivative of B A over A is just the matrix B. So let's see it, look at 
zoom out a little bit, look at all the different ways we can take these derivatives. So if our function returns a scalar and we take the derivative with respect to a scalar, we end up with a scalar. And you can work this out in your head, right? Uh, the result of this taking the derivative gives you every possible scalar derivative. So if you have a vector in and a vector out, you have a matrix of possible derivative, scalar derivatives. If you have a scalar in and a matrix out, or uh, sorry, matrix in, scalar out, you have a matrix of things uh, with which you can take, uh, to which you can take the derivative. So that works for scalars, vec uh, vectors, and matrices up to here. And then it gets a little hairy. If we want to do a vector with a matrix, all the possible scalar derivatives we can take are like a three tensor. That gets a little bit difficult because mul matrix multiplication or tensor multiplication is not really well defined. It ke becomes very difficult to keep track of in your head. So once we end up here in this area, um, basically you can do it. You can work out these derivatives in terms of three tensors and four tensors and five tensors, but it's not usually worth the complexity. And luckily, we don't really need the complexity because we can keep things e easy for ourselves. So we run into trouble if we look at this chain rule, for instance, here, k over w. That's a vector over a matrix. So that's uh, one of these question marks. So that's a place where we don't really want to work out all possible scalar derivatives anymore. And luckily, we don't have to. Oh, uh, question? Yes? Um, oh, yes. Uh, uh, so the question is, this is a matrix multiplied by a vector. So why was that a question mark? Um, it is a matrix multiplication, but the input and the output of the function are both vectors. So there is a matrix in here, but the result of this matrix multiplication is a vector. And the input, the thing with respect to which we're taking the derivative is also a vector. So this slide is actually a vector over vector here. So it's a matrix. The result is a matrix, as, you, as we saw, because the result is the matrix D. So with this one, we're fine. But once we get to this k over w, things start getting a little bit difficult. Luckily, the ultimate derivative that we're always interested in is always over this column on the left. Because the function that we're interested in, the loss, which is the only thing we ever want to take the, derivative, the global derivative over, is a scalar function. I mean, it takes lots and lots of inputs, all the weights of our, pra all the weights of our complicated model, but the output is always a single function. So this one, L over W, for whatever part of our model W is, that's always scalar over something else. It might be scalar, we might go further down this table, it might be a scalar over a three tensor or a four tensor or a five tensor. But that's easy to think about because that's just, if our weight tensor, whatever the shape of our weight tensor is, that's also the shape of our gradient. Because we're taking the gradient um, with the aim of getting a gradient update. So what we want to get out of this, ultimately, is for every parameter value, a little value that we're going to subtract from it. So at the end of this process, our gradient will always have the same shape as our parameter uh, tensor. So in that sense, it's easy. The only trouble is that, this, that we have these intermediate steps that work into three tensors or five tensors in diff difficult and complicated ways. So what we're going to do is we're not actually going to work out these intermediate values we are instead going to accumulate this product from left to right. So we're first going to compute L over Y, and we're going to use that value to compute L over H, and then we're going to use that value to compute L over K, and so on. So what we do, what we ask of our function, our function object, is well, the forward implementation is just what you would imagine it to be, Given your input, compute your outputs. So that's pretty straightforward. That's just what a function does. And then the backward, we are going to give it 
the derivative of the loss with respect to its outputs. So the, the product of this gradient, uh, the product of this chain rule so far. And then I want you, I want, what I want from this function is to compute this value, to work out this value and to give me the result. So if we're a bit smart about this, we don't actually need these intermediate products because we can just think about what this means, work it out in terms of matrix uh, computations, and actually perform those matrix computations. So let's look at this k over w again. This, uh, let's make that a bit more practical. So this is one of our modules. In fact, the first module we call in the forward pass and the last module we call in the backward pass, which does this, uh, computes this first layer of our neural network. And forward is this compute W X plus B. So for the backward, it has uh, three inputs, right? It had W, X, and B as inputs. So for the backward, we compute the derivative over all those three inputs with respect to all those three inputs. So given the loss over the K, over our output, whatever that is, compute these three values. And we're just going to look at the, uh, the left one and see how we do that. So we have this value. This is given. This on the left, L over K, is given. That's a vector. That's just a gradient over all these K values. That, was our, that were our outputs. And we need to figure out in some matrix multiplication terms how we're going to turn that into whatever this is. So we use the same trick again that we used earlier. If we're confused, if we don't know what it means, or if we don't know how to deal with this, we just look at the, um, we just look at one element of W. Instead of looking at trying to look at W as a whole, it's a little bit of a notation problem here, but we're just looking at the derivative with respect to element 2, 3 of W. So let's call this W now, then we're looking at the derivative with, just, uh, with respect to just this cell this element of the matrix. Uh, and L is already a scalar, so now we're looking at a scalar derivative, scalar of scalar. But somehow there's a vector in the middle that we need to get rid of. Luckily, we don't need to know how to do that. We don't need to work out this multiplication because we can just revert to the multivariate chain rule. So whatever happens that turns W into L, Whatever K does is a computation graph. And we just get some, uh, we just compute a bunch of scalar values, which are the elements of K. And those together in some way become L, right? So this allows us to just think of this as a computation graph. And then if we apply the multivariate chain rule to this, we just, it, uh, it tells us to just take, apply the chain rule along every computation path and sum the results of that. So the derivative of this vector, however, whatever that means, whatever that is, is the same as the sum over all of these individual computation paths. So even if k is not a vector, even if k is a tensor or a, a High, uh, high level tensor, like a six tensor, all we need to do is just take the derivative with respect to every one of its elements and sum that. Now it might be inefficient to compute it this way, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to look at what this means and then work that into a matrix operation. So now we have just the scalar uh, chain rule here over Ki. So now we can work out what that means for W3, uh, W23. So ki is just the ith element of this multiplication. That's just our, our forward pass. And we can ignore the b because that doesn't, uh, because our uh, w23 does not occur in that plus b part, the plus b term. So we can just ignore that. And then the um, ith element of this matrix multiplication, w times i, uh, sorry, w times x, it's just a dot product of the ith row of w times x with x, dot product of the ith row of w with x, which we can write out again as a sum. And we can work that sum 
to the left, so we get i of j, we get a sum over i and j of these elements, and these are all zero terms. Unless i is two and j is three, all these terms become zero. So actually, the only term that is left over is l over k two times x three, and that's our derivative uh, with respect to element 2, 3 of the matrix W. So to summarize, if we do this for just one element of the matrix, we get this, Ki over Xj. So now we can work this back to what this means in terms of matrix operations. It means that if we have to work out this L over K, K over W thing, we can just uh, work out all the products of an element i of this vector, L over k, and multiply it by an element j of the x vector, which is the outer product of the two vectors. So if you multiply two vectors, as I've shown here, not taking the dot product, but the outer product, then you get a matrix of every ele uh, matrix showing all the products of one element of one vector and one element of the other vector. That's called the outer product. And that outer product gives us the derivatives over W. So after all that, what we've worked out is this outer product is what we need to do to compute the local gradient for W. And we can do the same thing for the other, output, uh, for the other inputs. I won't go through it, but if you want to uh, practice this for yourself, you can see if you can work it out for X and work it out for B. They look like this. So now we have a computation. We have a function for this linear layer. So forward computation is just Wx plus b. And when it comes to the backward computation, when we're working out the gradients, and we've figured out what the loss with respect to k is, then we can turn that loss with respect to k, the derivative of the loss with respect to k, into the derivatives of the loss with respect to w, the loss with respect to x and the loss with respect to b. In terms of matrix multiplication, we can compute those matrix multiplications and that gives us our gradient steps. Uh, so just to summarize, if we have to work out a backward function, usually it's not necessary if you're sort of thinking, what the hell is he talking about? Don't worry, because usually you don't actually have to do this. You just have to know how it works because most of these functions that you would want to use have been implemented in your deep learning framework already. All of this multiplication stuff, there are functions for that already, and they have their own backward function. You just need to know how it works. But if you do end up writing your own function and you have to implement your own backward function, make sure you phrase the element in terms of scalar derivatives, because those are easy to understand. Then apply the multivariate chain rule to sum out any um, leftover matrices and tensors in your chain rule, and then work out what that means in terms of matrix, op uh, matrix operations. Uh, if you're still a little bit fuzzy and you ne happen to need to really know how this works, in case you ever need to implement it yourself, I recommend these two links. Uh, they were certainly very helpful for me. Um, so that's, let me see where we are. I think that's the basics of deep learning systems. Uh, and most deep learning systems also give you some kind of um, layers or modules that sort of cluster together bits of data and bits of uh, compu computation in a single, single object that you can instantiate. For instance, to create a single linear neural network layer, you need a W value, you need a B value, and you need a function that applies them to an input. Uh, so you can put that all together in a module and then you can just tell your learning framework, give me a linear layer. Uh, so that's sort of just a higher level of doing this. Um, and uh, well, it's time for the break. So I made it to just the deep learning system. Uh, let's take a 15 minute breather and then uh, we'll look at how to make this work for deep and big neural networks. All right. Time for the second half.
find your seat, finish your conversation. Um, so now we have the basic ingredients of a deep learning framework. We know how to build one of these computation graphs, feed it however big a tensor we like, and still do backpropagation on it. Um, so now the question is, how do we make this work for very big neural networks? How, when we have a very big and very deep neural network, lots of parameters, lots of layers, how do we make sure that we can actually train it using gradient descent? Uh, which is sort of where things slowed down in the, at the end of the 90s, uh, or the, uh, yeah, around the end of the 90s, and things started picking up when the deep learning revolution uh, started. And this was basically why the deep learning revolution started, because we figured out how to do these things, how to solve these problems. Um, so I'll focus on four problems. The vanishing gradient problem using mini batches, uh, using optimizers, and using regularizers. Um, these are sort of the basic things you need to know if you're going to train a deep learning model using a, a, a deep learning system. Let's start with the vanishing gradients. This was really the big problem that stopped everything, that stopped deep learning from happening. Um, so let's look at a simple example. Here we have a, a one a neural network with just one hidden node at each layer. Just to simplify things. And just one weight, W1, W2, W3, W4. Um, and a sigmoid activation. So let's see what happens if we, uh, basically if we start training, if we start, if we ins, uh, initialize this neural network, we have to pick some random values for W1, W2, and W3, and W4. Um, and it's quite important that we pick the right values. Uh, or that we don't pick the wrong values. Specifically that we don't pick our values too big. Because if these values are very big, we're going to end up here. All the activations are going to end up here, go into the sigmoid all the way to the right. Which means that once, when it comes time to do the backpropagation, to take this local derivative of the sigmoid, we're over here, where the function is almost flat. So the gradient, or the derivative, will be almost zero. And if at the start, for all of our data points, the gradient is always zero, and we don't learn, because the gradient is what we subtract from our current weights to uh, update our weights. And if that's zero, then we're not updating our weights, we're not learning. So these w's shouldn't be too big. So let's make them a bit smaller, make them a bit smaller. But if we make them too small, uh, then we end up here, near the zero. And that's even worse, because if we get a zero out of this layer and we multiply it with a small weight or if we get something close to a zero out of the sigmoid, multiplied by a small weight, then the activations go to zero. Uh, the outputs of the activations go to zero along this line. Uh, so not only do we not have a gradient, because we're in this regime again where the sigmoid flattens out, we also don't have an activation. So the neural network also predicts zero for everything we do. So we need to hit this sweet spot where the gradients are when we start training, we get a gradient. So the outputs are not too big and not too small. That's basically the business of initialization. Oh, something weird happened. The, bu the business of initialization, which is setting your gradients at the start of training, initializing your network. Uh, and there are two, uh, two popular ways. You can choose W, because it's not a single value, it's usually a matrix. You can use, uh, choose a random orthogonal value a random orthogonal matrix, so a matrix with eigenvalues that are all one, uh, because then it doesn't blow your activations up too much, but it also doesn't shrink them. Basically what you want is you want to initialize your W, so that if you multiply a bunch of random values by it, um, the mean of those random values doesn't change, and the variance doesn't change. So if the input, the mean coming in is zero and the variance is one, then the output mean should also be zero and the variance output variance should also be one in every direction. Uh, and that uh, that's true if all your eigenvalues are one of W, so you can do that. Or you can use what's called Gloro uniform initialization, where you just sample all your um, weights from a uniform distribution between these two uh, values. And this should be a positive on the right, not a negative, otherwise 
there aren't any values in your interval. Um, and I won't go into the details, but if you uh, do this, then you will also have this property that your weights don't blow up and don't shrink. But even if you do that with the sigmoid, you kind of still have a problem if you want lots of layers. Because the maximum derivative of the sigmoid, it's the bit where it climbs the quickest, is 0.25. Which means that if you have these beautifully initialized uh, layers, but you have a load of sigmoid functions, that from the top, working backwards, doing backpropagation, your first gradient, well, let's say it's ideal, so your first local gradient will be 0 0.25, but by the time you multiply that with the next uh, sigmoid uh, gradient, you get 0 0.25 times 0 0.25, so 1 over 16. And 1 after that, you get 1 over 64, and so on. So with the number of layers, your gradient also shrinks to zero because the gradient is so small, the maximal gradient is so small. So basically for this reason, people don't use sigmoids anymore if they can avoid it, and they instead prefer the ReLU, which is a simpler activation function, which is just linear, except that if the val inco input value is negative, uh, we clamp it to zero. So if bigger than zero, we keep it smaller than zero, we set it to zero. And this has the nice property that everything that we let through has a derivative of one. This is just, in this regime, it's just an identity function, or zero. So we either get a derivative of zero or one. And if we ensure that enough for enough of our inputs, this particular neuron has a positive activation, then we always get a nice gradient that doesn't decay for deeper and deeper networks. There is a small risk that if for all of our inputs, this particular neuron, all the activations are always negative, then for all of our inputs we get a negative gradient, we get a zero gradient here, and we have what we call a dead neuron. Because that's not going to learn anymore, it's not going to update its weights anymore because the gradient is always zero. So that's a problem with ReLUs, but usually um, if you keep things simple, it's a problem that doesn't happen. So those are two... Uh, ways of solving the vanishing gradient problem, initialize properly and use ReLUs. Mini-batching, I can be quick. We've talked about regular gradient descent where you compute the loss with respect to your whole data and stochastic gradient descent where you compute the loss with respect to one instance. This is sort of in-between in between, uh, version where you chunk your data into small batches called mini-batches and you compute the loss with respect to a small batch. So not you do stochastic gradient descent, but not with respect to one instance, but with respect to a couple of instances. And you sort of move over your data set sequentially, um, which gives you sort of trade-off between the benefits and the drawbacks of um, stochastic and non-stochastic gradient descent. Basically, you want to keep batches of somewhere in between 16 and 128 instances. Um, small batches are nice because they give you this stochasticity, they give you this randomness that helps your search a lot, uh, and for lots of other technical reasons, which I won't go into. Bigger batches are nice because basically you run these neural networks usually on your GPU, which can run the whole thing in parallel for every element, for everything in your batch. So you don't have to loop over your batch and run the network for everything in your batch, it's that the whole thing is just run in parallel. So if you chunk into batches of 128, your whole training epoch is going to be much faster than batches of 16. So it's very tempting to go for bigger and bigger batches for as big as you can fit into your GPU memory. But practically you get better results if you have a bit more patience and use smaller batches. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. But that's called mini batch gradient descent. And if you start doing deep learning, you have to set a batch size. So you need to know about uh, batches. Then optimizers. So basically, it's all gradient descent, like I said. But it's not really vanilla gradient descent. There are a couple of techniques to help gradient descent navigate some of the more uh, ugly corners of your loss curve. Specifically, if you have a very complicated neural network, you have lots of different parameters doing lots of different things. Like these bias parameters are going to do very different things from these weight parameters, and they're going to have very different gradients. So, I d and vanilla gradient descent uh, 
responds to all these gradients with the same learning rate. It moves equally fast in every direction. And what you really want is ways to uh, smooth that out a little bit and to be a bit adaptive and to basically give every parameter its own learning rate. And also, uh, you want to deal with these very small local minima. So if you have a bit of a rough loss surface, you just want to move over that, and you don't want to get stuck in very small local minima. So there's lots of ways of doing this, and we'll look at just three of them, momentum, nestor momentum, and Adam. And basically, the basic advice before we look at the details is just to use Adam. Uh, but sometimes nestor momentum is also a good to give a try. But let's look at regular momentum first. Basically, if we have plane gradient descent, which looks like this. We, have the, we update the weights by subtracting uh, the gradient multiplied by the learning rate eta, which, as I said before, is a little bit like this uh, blind hit hitchhiker in a snowstorm walking down uh, a hill. And the basic intuition behind momentum is that instead of using a hitchhiker, we can use a boulder and let the boulder roll down the hill. So what we're doing instead of letting the gradient move our point around the loss, curve, loss surface. We are treating gradient, as it were, as a force. In physical sense, we're treating it as gravity. So our point navigating the loss surface has a velocity, if you remember your, um, your physics. And that velocity stays the same if we don't do anything. And we pull at it using the gradient. So the gradient acts as an acceleration rather than a velocity, so it occasionally pulls Every step it pulls on this model, but the model also has a kind of momentum that pushes it in the direction it's going. So that looks like this. We have, let's call it a velocity. So the velocity is just the same as the previous velocity, scaled down a little bit. So the mu here is a bit like friction. If we don't do anything, the velocity slows down and down and down a little bit. And we pull the velocity in the direction of the current gradient. So we have two hyperparameters now. We don't have just the learning rate. We have eta and mu. And then the velocity is what's added to the uh, weight vector every time. So basically, this is like a boulder rolling down a hill. So it allows it to roll over small, meaningless local minima. Um, and there's a lot to be said about momentum, but let's leave it there. Uh, Nestor of momentum is just a small insight that if we have this momentum step plus this gradient step, um, we can also, and we know what the momentum step is before we compute the gradient, we can also apply the momentum step first and then compute the gradient. So if we know we're going to move to this point and then apply the gradient, we might as well move to that point first and compute the gradient for that point instead of that point. Then we get a slightly better gradient. Nestor of momentum. Uh, Adam incorporates this idea together with the idea that basically every gradient, every parameter in your model sort of has its own loss surface, has its own preferences for what the learning rate should be, as it were, for or how, how strongly the learning rate should apply, how aggressively you want to move in that direction. Uh, so what we do is we try to estimate the average gradient per parameter, per dimension in our model space. Uh, and we try to scale the update step for every parameter uh, in isolation. And since this, um, uh, since we don't know beforehand what the values are going to be, we need to take what's called a moving average. In this case, we take an exponential moving average, which looks like this. So we have a current value of m. Oh, sorry, we have a previous value of m, which we average together with the, we take the convex mean between the previous value of m and the current gradient. So at the start, we set m to 0. And then every time, we take the average of the new gradient and the old gradient. And we update it, and we update it, and we update it. So we get a kind of exponentially decaying influence of the previous gradient that add to this mean. And we do the same for the variance. So the square, it's the uncentered variance, so it's the square of the previous gradients. And then we just subtract that. So we don't subtract 
subtract the gradient, we subtract the mean, the weighted mean of all the previous gradients. Divided by the uh, variance with a little epsilon so that it doesn't go to zero. Um, there's not a lot of home, not a lot more intuition I think I can give you about Adam, but that's basically the, basically the uh, idea. And it works very well. This is just the method that happened to work pretty well. So this is what we uh, usually use. And again, you don't really have to implement this yourself. It's all part of these deep learning systems. Every deep learning system, you can select Adam as an optimizer and just set it to run. Uh, so it has lots of hyperparameters, beta 1, beta 2, epsilon, uh, but the defaults are fine. So all you have to do usually is set the learning rate. So that's optimizers, basically slight adaptations of gradient descent that help with big heterogeneous uh, model spaces. Which brings us to regularizers. Uh, which is the final sort of problem you encounter if your model grows bigger and bigger and bigger. It has a bigger capacity to memorize uh, your data. You can see some of these big models are literally gigabytes in size. If you download them to use them, you're downloading one, two gigabytes worth of weight tensors. Uh, so there's a lot of room in the model to memorize stuff. So there's a lot of capacity and ability to overfit. And what a regularizer does, it sort of, uh, it doesn't reduce your model class. All of these complicated models are still allowed, but it sort of uh, pulls the model in a little bit towards the simpler models. It sort of gives your learning system a little bit of a preference for simplicity, and it depends on your regularizer how you define simplicity, but it gives you a preference for simpler models so that the complicated models are still allowed, but only if they're really necessary. Let's look at a very simple regularizer to start with, the L2 regularizer. It basically works like this. If this is your model space, and these are two models, light orange and dark orange, then you just take the length of this vector and you add it, multiplied by a little uh, hyperparameter, you add it to your loss. So the further out from your origin, basically the bigger your, the weights of your network are, the more you pay uh, on top of your loss term. Uh, I forgot to include it, but you can actually do this in the TensorFlow playground. Uh, you can add a regularizer and play around with it. But I guess we don't have time for it anyway. But this is basically a very simple way of saying if there's a good solution here near the origin with small weights and there's a good solution with big weights, then prefer the good solution with the small weights because it pays less in terms of this uh, L1, uh, L2 uh, norm, L2 uh, penalty. Um, oops, sorry. So we have a, a vector norm, uh, the vector norm, which we um, use to determine the size of this penalty. And you can generalize the vector norm. This is how the vector norm is defined. This is basic Pythagoras, right? You can generalize that by taking these square roots and this, uh, sorry, these squares and the square root and turning them into exponentiation to p, uh, summing and then taking a uh, p of root, uh, which gives you slightly different distances for points in your space. So if you do this for p is 2, and you look at all the points that are distance 1 from the origin, it forms a circle, as you would expect. And if you do it for p is 1, and you look at all the points that are distance 1 from the origin, under this new distance measure, you get this shape, a diamond. Because, uh, yeah, I should say, uh, no, I shouldn't say it, it works out. So uh, this, the one-th root just disappears. So you're just taking the sum of w and the sum of b. And these are all the values for which those sums are one, right? If you go smaller than one, it looks like this. If you go bigger than one towards infinity, it looks like this. But that's not really important for now. We're just focusing on the L1 norm because that gives us the L1 regularizer, which is just like the L2 regularizer, but we're using the L1 length of these vectors instead of the L2 length. And the effect that that has is that our loss surface gets these corners in it. 
that if we are sort of in this area, that it really pays to just uh, make this zero. Basically, if you have any parameters for which the, ver the value is very small, it starts with this regularizer, it starts really paying to ma just make them zero because it gets rid of a lot of this, uh, this um, penalty here, this lost uh, regularizer term. Uh, or to give you an analogy, if you think of normal gradient descent as a ball and putting a marble in that ball and letting it roll down to the center, then a regularizer is a little bit like tipping the ball to say, don't give me the uh, actual minimum, the, the actual minimum, but give me the minimum plus add a little balance in that direction. So we're tipping the ball, and we get a new, new minimum slightly to the left of the old minimum, right? And L1 regularization is a little bit like using a rectangular ball. So if we don't have any regularization, we still, we let the marble roll down the middle, we still get the middle of the ball. But if we tip the ball, the marble will almost certainly end up in one of these grooves here. So the parts that are not the grooves are sort of not stable equilibria. That's basically what L1 regularization gives you. Uh, here's a plot. This is our lost surface from a while ago. Uh, if we apply L2 regularization, we see that the areas with good loss are sort of pulled in towards the uh, towards the origin here. So we are pulling all these models towards the origin. And if we do L1 regularization, we get the same effect, but we see that there is a kind of groove along the edges where, we, um, where one of the values is zero. And the benefit of this is sparsity. If, you, if lots of your weights are zero, you have a sparse model, and you can say, well, those things don't matter. Those things are those features with those weights are features that don't matter. Uh, finally, we have dropout, which is, uh, uh, operates in a very different way, but it's uh, also very useful. Basically, the idea of dropout is that you um, randomly disable hidden nodes in your network during training. And you train only for every training pass, you do this differently, so, and then you train only the remaining connections. Then during inference, you have to scale your uh, activations a little bit because suddenly you have lots more activations. But that turns out to work very well because you're sort of making your network more robust and you're forcing your network to deal with all these uh, things that might be missing. And you're forcing every hidden node to take, to take into account multiple sources of information. There's a good quote here uh, that says, a dropout simply described it's a concept that if you can learn how to do a task repeatedly while drunk, you should be able to do the task even better when sober. And that's basically what dropout does. So you damage your network during training, and then during inference, when you're using a network, it gets better, uh, which functions as a regularizer. And there are many other tricks available. Uh, but those are the four points I wanted to talk about to make it work. Uh, I'm guessing we're going to skip the autoencoders. You uh, save that for the second deep learning lecture. But just very quickly, uh, let's talk about convolutions. But first, let's talk about where this puts us. And so now we have a deep learning system, and we have a way, we have all the tricks we need to make neural networks big and deep. And that's sort of the point in history where the deep learning revolution really starts. And you get lots of news articles like this about all this cool stuff that uh, deep learning can do. AlphaGo was a big one. Uh, so here's a few highlights. It's from 2014, so already quite some time ago. This is a single neural network that consumes images and spits out text. And it's just trained on paired images and descriptions of those images. That's all you're doing. And you feed the images through the network and after it's trained for a long, long time on a lot, a lot of data, uh, it's learned by itself how to interpret these images and how to generate language.
So we haven't told the network what language is or how language works. We've given it, given it a vocabulary, but we haven't told it anything about how to chain together words. And it's learned by itself what sentences are, how sentences should work, and how sentences should work to describe things in the image. Pretty accurately, although it does sometimes fail. Uh, here's another nice one, style transfer. This one actually works with a pre-trained network, so we don't actually have to train this. But it just uses a certain trick from a pre-trained pre -trained image classifier, classifier sorry, to take a photograph and to apply the style from any given painting to it. So you can use these neural networks to really separate style and content, at least to this extent. Then there's image to image translation, that's also a nice one. Uh, so let's start top right, where we see, uh, well, we have a very simple translation, which is to desaturate an image. We can make a color image black and white, but the opposite is a lot more difficult. And that's what we do here. So we generate a training set by desaturating images, and then we feed the desaturated image to the network, and we train it to generate colors. Or we do some edge detection. So we generate edges for a given photograph, and then we train it to fill in the, uh, the missing, missing color. So this is a handbag generated from these edges, and so on for the maps and the street scenes. Um, but for this, you need paired images. So one year later, they came out with a system that could do this for unpaired images, like zebras and horses. We don't have training examples for what zebra should turn into what horse. But we do have a big bag of images of horses and a big bag of images of zebras. And you can actually translate one to the other. And in fact, if you do it for every frame of a movie, then you get pretty convincing results or at least pretty stable results. So a lot of cool stuff that you can do. Oh yeah, and um, just to show the accelerating pace, this is a specific type of system called a GAN. It doesn't really matter what the details are, we'll talk about that later. But just to show the accelerating pace of, of innovation, this is what we could do in 2014, and this is the best we could do last year. This is the image I showed you in the um, opening lecture. Uh, so things are moving very quickly and we're able to do a lot of very cool stuff. Uh, but it doesn't work, most of this stuff doesn't work if you just use these fully connected layers that we've seen so far. Where you connect every layer of the input to every layer of the first hidden layer. Those are relatively weak models. If you want this to work, if you want to do this kind of cool stuff, you need to understand a little bit about your domain and inject that into the architecture of your network. So let's have a look at the first way of doing that, convolution layers. Convolution layers are a way of telling your neural network, I know that my input is an image, and I'm not going to give you just a factor of features, I'm going to give you the image. And that allows you to uh, do two things, compared to this convolutional layer, uh, sorry, compared to this fully connected layer. So this is a fully connected layer. Every input is a, a pixel of the input image. And for the first hidden layer, we just connect every hidden node to every input image, uh, every input node. Uh, so that results in lots and lots of weights, lots and lots of nodes. And to make this network more efficient, we are going to reduce the number of connections in a smart way. And we are going to share weights between some of these uh, connections. So for a lot of these connections we're going to say you are going to have the same weight value. So that massively reduces the parameter space. And we do that as follows. So we start with an input image and we take a little square patch of pixels. So we have a f let's say 25 by 25 input image. We take a square patch of pixels, a window, and we connect only those input nodes, only those pixels, to one hidden node. And this hidden node, this one node in our hidden first hidden layer, is only connected to these four pixels. And then we move the hidden, then we move the uh, window, we slide the window over one pixel. And for those four pixels, we create another hidden 
and so on and so forth, which gives us four by four hidden nodes. Four by four hidden nodes. And that's our first hidden layer. And we also say these four connections for all of these hidden nodes are always the same for every single hidden node. So this hidden layer consists of just four weights. It's 16 times four connections, but there are just four separate weight values shared between all these connections. And then if that's not quite enough, we can do the whole, sim whole thing again and create a second channel with just four more weights we get a second uh, second hidden layer, or well, it's it's all the first hidden layer, but we add 16 more nodes to our first hidden layer, and that's what's called a convolution. So it's basically a fully connected network, except you take away lots of nodes, lots of connections, and you uh, share lots of the weights. You put uh, clamp lots of the weights together. Just a little bit of terminology. So the size of this sliding window, the sliding window is called the kernel. The uh, and if the sides of the sliding window are th three in both directions, then you have a three by three kernel. They're usually odd numbers because it's nice to have the size of the hidden layer be s the same as the input layer. So what we do is we give it, we make it odd numbers, and then we add a little padding around the image. In this case, padding of one, so that when we're on the edge, we can still fit one, exactly one kernel on the edge. So the output has the same resolution as the input. Uh, and then the size of the step we take is called the stride. So if you have stride 1, a 3x3 three three kernel, and one pixel of padding, then the output will have the same resolution as the input. Uh, which means that if, you're, if you think of your input image as one of these three tensors, as we drew before, then your kernel basically selects one little block of 3 by 3 by 3 and turns it into a 1 by 1 by 8, if we have 8 output channels, block in your output. So a convolutional layer, if you arrange it properly, turns a 3 tensor into a 3 tensor, turns an image into another image and increases the number of channels, or it, it modifies the channels. Sometimes it keeps it the same, but it modifies these channels. So you do that a couple of times, and ideally what you want as you build a large network is for the um, resolution slowly to decrease and the number of channels slowly to increase. Because then we're looking at the picture with a slow lower resolution. We don't care so much about exactly where things happen, but we know much more about what, ha what is happening there. So to reduce the resolution, we usually use what's called a max pooling layer. And a max pooling layer just takes one small patch of pixels. Usually if you do two by two, then so you uh, look at a two by two patch of pixels, you divide your whole image into two by two patches of pixels, not overlapping this time, and you just replace each patch by the maximum value. And that's just something. You can also do average pooling, but it turns out that max pooling works a little better. So now you've reduced the resolution of your image by uh, half in every direction. And you can chain together these convolutions and max pooling layers, which looks like this. So you add one convolution, you get another image with more channels. You add a max pooling layer and the resolution reduces. You add some more pooling steps. And then after a while you get, essentially if you keep doing this, you get a single pixel image with a huge amount of channels which is basically a vector representation of your whole image. And then you can add a couple of fully connected layers and then one classification layer on top of that if you're doing image classification, which is sort of where these methods were invented. Uh, and usually you use ReLU activations after each layer, uh, sorry, after each convolution layer, not after the max pooling layers. So this gives you a basic image classification network. Um, you can do this in Keras. This is from the fourth, fourth worksheet. Looks like this. So you train a sequential model. You add some convolution layers. You indicate the kernel size, the activation that you want, and the input shape. And you chain these things together. And at the end, you get some dense layers. We add some dropouts as well to regularize things. And then at the end, you get a dense layer 
which is one of these com uh, fully connected layers, with 10 outputs, and every one of those 10 outputs corresponds to one of your classes. So you do softmax, you do classification, and you train the whole thing end to end, and that gives you a convolutional neural network. Um, skip this one. So once the whole thing is trained, we can have a look at what it what it's actually doing. We can try to visualize if it's trained and it works well. We can try to visualize what it's actually responding to by looking at one of these nodes up high up in the network and see what kind of input triggers it, what kind of input gives it a high response. Uh, you can do that in slightly different ways. I don't know exactly what they've done here. But basically what they visualized here for the first layer of the network, the sort of things it responds to, and you see that the first sort of convolutions are mostly edge detection. So these are, these give you neurons that respond very highly if you get sort of, an, see an edge in the image somewhere. If you see one black region right next to a white region. So one highly um, uh, activating output to one low activating output. And then these, the next layer over sort of assembles these edges into features. Uh, this was trained on um, face facial data, incidentally. So the next one over sort of assembles these into facial features. You can sort of see that it's responding to noses and responding to eyes and stuff like that. And the next layer over assembles this into faces. And then you're seeing the sort of um, all these features come together. So you're seeing sort of that the, uh, the whole network builds up slowly, step by step, higher and higher representations, semantically higher representations. So it starts with basic raw data, works it into features, and then works it into eyes and noses, and then into whole faces. Uh, and some more examples here, which I'll skip. Um, but uh, do follow these links, so you can look at basically, well, just quickly, because it's, it is a lot of fun, this one. Uh, so basically what they do here is that they get this really big convolutional network that was trained by Google, a little bit later than this other one. And they start looking at a node and they start, instead of optimizing the weights to fit the training objective, they optimize the input so that it causes the neuron to activate. Very roughly, I mean, yeah, follow the links to read all the details because I'm probably slightly mangling what they did, but that's basically the principle of what they do. So they're just generating images for which a particular neuron gets very excited. And then you get these weird looking images, sort of abstract art. And you can see that the features that it's responding to are sort of bird-like features. You can compare that to the uh, images from the data set to which it was this particular neuron responds very well. And you see indeed that it basically this one neuron is a bird detector. And for all of these neurons, you can do this. You also do this in the opposite direction. So what things doesn't it respond to? The minimum activation. And so this one is uh, a neuron that is that has very low activation when it sees a dog for some reason. Um, so you can actually look into your network and see that it's slowly building up these intermediate representations. So those are convolution layers. Um, yeah, I'll save the autoencoders for the next uh, lecture, next deep learning lecture. Well, here's a little preview. And I'll finish up with the question of what's the point? So what is actually, yeah. Uh, so we've done convolutions, we skip autoencoders. What is deep learning? Uh, What's so special about all of this? Why is this so different from the traditional machine learning that we've done so far? Um, and a large part of that is what we call end-to-end -end learning. So if you look at a sort of old machine learning system or an old AI system that uses machine learning, for instance, uh, by which I mean old-fashioned, the old way of doing it, you might say something like, well, we're going to analyze newspapers so that we can ask natural language questions about things that happen in the newspaper. And then you build this pipeline that does optical character recognition, you can do then, so you get the characters. Uh, tokenization, so you build the characters into words. Name identity recognition, so you figure out which companies and people they're talking about. And then relation extraction, so what's it actually saying about the relations between those companies and people? What are they doing to each other? Uh, 
stuff like that. And then once you have the relations extracted, you can start asking natural questions. And what we sort of found out, I think, in the end of the 90s, start of the noughties, that we could do all of these things pretty well. Basically, we started to get to the point where all of these things we could do with sort of 99% accuracy. Or, you know, it, it only went wrong in a very small number of cases. But the problem is if you chain together a lot of modules that all have 99% accuracy, the uh, error over your whole pipeline is not going to be 1%. It's not even going to be 5%. It's going to be something like 50%. It's going to blow up. Because suddenly, instead of getting proper clean input, like the one you trained it on, your tokenization is going to get slightly noisy input, which is going to make its output much worse, because that's not what you trained it on. And that's not what it's designed to deal with. And the same for named entity recognition, and the same for relation extraction. So every step is getting noisier and noisier input, and you're sort of accumulating this error because you've trained these things in isolation and then chained them together. So what you need to do, maybe you can do a bit of pre-training in isolation, but once you've chained everything together, you also want to train the whole thing on your uh, data end-to-end, -end, which is a kind of, you have to do a kind of fine-tuning to get rid of these errors. Um, and that's what we call end-to-end -end learning, which means that you don't just, you can't just do your normal engineering solution of breaking your problem into subunits and chaining them together. Uh, or at least the subunits need more than just the ability to compute a forward pass. They also need to compute a backward pass. Your pipeline also needs to be able to support uh, a training signal back down the uh, direction of computation. That's what we call end-to-end -end learning. And that's sort of the basic power, I think, of, of um, deep learning. So if we look at the traditional framework of machine learning that I told you about, where we basically we take the raw data, we extract some features, and then we start doing the learning. And that gives us things like classification, regression, and clustering. That contrasts with deep learning in that deep learning operates directly on the raw data, works into a complete a fully learning pipeline that can learn end-to-end. -end. So the whole thing learns end-to-end, -end, uh, which means we have to simplify by saying instead of having a specific le learning method for each model, we have to say we always use some form of gradient descent because otherwise things are just too difficult. And then we are much more flexible. We don't just have to do classification. We don't just have to do regression. We can actually make this a computer program. And we can make it do anything we like, so long as we have a sort of example of what it's supposed to do, of the output that it's supposed to produce, we can work out the error with, uh, we can work out the difference from what it's doing to what it should be doing, and backpropagate that error down our pipeline. So even though deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, uh, it's in, uh, uh, in many ways a much more flexible and much more, uh, yeah, much more flexible approach. So to give you a final analogy to end on, I would say deep learning is the classic le machine learning as Lego is the Playmobil. Both of them can give you a bus to play with, but if you have a Lego bus, then you can actually take it apart and also build a spaceship with it. Uh, and that's sort of the difference, uh, the difference in, uh, in approaches. And that's where I'll leave it today. And uh, I'll see you on Thursday to discuss uh, probability again. <laughs>